we're discussing on this program each day the subject, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of your life? What's the purpose of it? Why are you here? Why are we all here? How did we come to be here? And we've been talking especially about the various experiences that different ones of us try to have in order to solve that question. And uh, to many of us, they are just bewildering. Some of us feel, well, we have to find ourselves and we try things like transcendental meditation where we try through controlling our thought patterns and our mental concentration to somehow transcend the limitations of this earthbound existence. And yet we don't seem to achieve any sense of meaning in our lives, however much we try these mental contortionist tricks. Some of us have tried things like Zen Buddhism or the Eastern religions, and we have tried through, at times, annihilating our feelings or trying to make our psychic processes passive. We have tried somehow to get in touch with a deeper part of life or a deeper part of the universe. Others of us, of course, have tried the world of nature and have at attempted to experience some of the oneness that uh, they talk about in Hinduism, that sense of oneness with the nature or with the spirit of the universe. And yet we often find that we are having an experience that seems still partial to us and seems in some way not convincing. Others of us have tried various forms of Christianity and church attendance and have discovered that they too are very frustrating and seem at times too human, uh, too connected with the ordinary everyday world, too wrapped up in interrelationships with other people rather than with a vertical relationship between us and whatever the spirit behind the universe is. And uh, most of us, whether we have come through university or not, are equally bewildered about these attempts that we've made to discover the meaning of life. And we just don't know where to go. That's really what we've begun to try to find out in these discussions that we have each day on this program. And you may remember that a few days ago we started to study the explanation of our personalities that is given in the early chapters of the Bible. And there we saw, I think, some answers and possible explanations of the difficulties so many of us have with what we call religious experiences. Because there it is evident that God made us like himself. He made us, as that verse in Genesis says, in his image. He made us like himself, uh, primarily so that we could have friendship with him. You remember we said that you can't have great friendship with your Yorkshire Terrier because he's okay on playing with a ball, but he's not great on discussing Beethoven's Fifth or discussing Chopin or appreciating Van Gogh. And so you're limited in the relationship you can have with a life that is lower than your own. You really, in order to have a full experience of friendship with someone, have to find someone who has the same capabilities and capacities as yourself. And that is the Creator's purpose in making you. You're not made just to be a bus conductor or just to be an orchestra conductor. You're not made to be just a secretary or just to be a managing director. You're made to be the friend of your creator, your maker. He has planned a relationship with you that he can't have with anybody else, none of the rest of us. 
will know him just as you will know him. And he will not be able to show himself to any of the rest of us in the same way that he shows himself to you. So you're actually unique. And you're unique partly because you're made like him in a way that nobody else is. And you remember we discussed what that meant. You remember we looked back to the early verses in Genesis which describe the whole creation in childlike terms because, of course, manhood at that point in history was in his childhood. And he was able to understand these things in a childlike way. And that's why the Creator talked about making us out of dust. And you remember he took the Hebrew word is afar, he took the afar from the Adama, Adama is ground, and he made our bodies. And you and I don't need any persuasion to believe that our bodies are made of dust because we can open a coffin years and years after our dad or mum are dead and we can see that their bodies are beginning to crumble into dust. And we even use those words, you remember, at a funeral we say dust to dust, earth to earth, ashes to ashes. So we don't need any persuasion to believe that when we see our loved one dead, their body is there, but they long ago have left the body. And the body is just a, a collection of earth in a certain form. And then you remember the verses in Genesis, I think it's in chapter 2, go on to say, and God breathed into man the breath of life. And we talked about breath, the Hebrew word ruach, which means wind or spirit, being the very essence of God himself, his very spirit. What makes God God? That is the spirit. And he breathed into us his own spirit. That's what gives us life. That's why when you look at your dad or mum after they're dead, they just look as if it's not them at all. You know, their very life spark seems to have disappeared from them because it's God's life in us that gives us life. If you say, well, what is spirit? Well, it's his very essence. It's the very essence of God. You could say a little when you talked about the spirit of Churchill, uh, what spirit the man had. You're really talking about what makes Churchill Churchill. You're talking about that mixture of courage and bravery and valor and determination and stubbornness and high-mindedness that made Churchill Churchill. It's the very essence of a person. It's what gives a person life. Of course, with God, it's more than that because it's his very heart. It's what makes him alive. It what's, uh, it's what enlivens the whole universe. It's what gives beauty to the breakers on the Hawaiian beaches. It's what gives freshness to the spring breezes this very spirit of God. And God breathed into us his spirit. And then you remember the next part of the verse says, and man became a living soul. And the word is Hebrew. The Hebrew word is nephesh. But the Greek word for soul is the one that gives us the clue to what it is. The Greek word is suke, which under the Anglo-Saxon uh, sound changes becomes psyche. And of course that becomes psychology. In other words, God took uh, dust from the earth made our bodies, breathed into, his, into us his own spirit life. And then those two things resulted in a third entity, a third level of life, which is our psychological part, our mind and emotions and our wills. And that's what makes man uniquely man. He's not an angel because that's just a spirit. He's not a, an animal because that's just a body. He's a human being because he has a spirit, a soul and a body. And what we have been saying is that many of us have tried to find God through the exercise of our souls. And that's why our so-called experiences of religion are so unsatisfactory. Because we try by manipulating the mind in transcendental meditation or in introspection. We try to achieve some kind of knowledge of ourselves or knowledge of reality. All we get is a knowledge of ourselves. Because while the body is the world conscious part of us through our senses, through our five senses, we perceive the, the world of things and circumstances and people. And while our spirit is the God conscious part of us, the part of us that can be aware of God, the soul is the self conscious part of us. And so all we do when we engage in any mental or emotional activity is 
engage in a relationship with ourselves. All we become conscious of is ourselves. We don't become conscious of God. And so when we engage in transcendental meditation or in Zen Buddhism, in self-negation, trying to negate any feelings, all we're doing is having a conversation with ourselves. We're not getting any deeper than that. That's why so many of us, even in Christianity, who get our satisfaction from the beauty of the cathedral or the beauty of the church or the beauty of the liturgy or the beautiful beauty of the Gregorian chants, that's why we too have an unsatisfactory experience of religion. Because we're engaged not in any spiritual exercise at all, we're engaged simply in a soulish activity where we become more conscious of ourselves. Many of us who are younger try mysticism which is primarily a preoccupation with our own experience of God and becomes equally satisfactory, uh, unsatisfactory. It's simply looking in upon our own souls as we're trying to worship God at the same time. Let's talk a little more tomorrow about the frustrations of mysticism.